Welcome to the 107th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Jasper Ford, author of the innovative Thursday Next series of novels. The latest Thursday Next novel, The Woman Who Died a Lot, was recently published. Stay tuned for the interview with Jasper Ford. Jasper, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. First, I wanted to see if you could read the first page or two of your new novel, The Woman Who Died a Lot. Um, everything comes to an end. A good bottle of wine, a summer's day, a long-running sitcom, one's life, and eventually our species. The question for many of us is not that everything will come to an end, but when, and can we do anything vaguely useful until it does? In the case of a good bottle of wine, probably not much, although the very act of consumption might, might make one believe otherwise. A well-laid summer's day should not expect too much of itself either, and sitcoms never die. They simply move to a zombie-like existence in rerun heaven. Of the remaining two, the end of one's life and that of our species, regular subscribers to my exploits will recall that I've seen myself die a few years back, and given my past record, it was probable that much useful work would be done between then and now. As to the end of our species, the possibility of annihilation was quite real, well documented, and went by the unimaginative title of Asteroid HR 6984. Whether the human race managed to figure out a worthwhile function for itself in the 37 years until possible collision was dependent upon its level of optimism. But it wasn't all bad news. In fact, due to a foible of human nature that denies us the ability to focus on more than one threat at a time, the asteroid was barely news at all. HR 6984's convenient lack of urgency and its current likelihood of hitting the Earth of only around 34% had relegated it well past such front-page news as the stupidity surplus and the current round of fiery cleansings by an angry deity. Instead, the hurtling lump of space debris was consigned to pop culture damnation on page 12, sandwiched somewhere between guinea pig accessorizing and the apparent relevant eating habits of non-celebrities. Great. Well, if someone hasn't read a Thursday Next novel before, how would you describe the series? And more specifically, how would you describe your new book, The Woman Who Died a Lot? Oh, my goodness. Uh, this, yes, this would take uh, quite a while. <laughs> um, I, I think essentially, uh, essentially, they're <laughs> very difficult to explain, but that isn't helpful. Um, the, the, I suppose the broad conceit of them uh, is that it's about uh, a woman named Thursday Next who works for a policing agency inside of the book world. The book world being this, um, this, this, um, this world behind the printed page where all the characters of all the books that have ever been written, when they're not being read themselves, uh, are off duty and have a bit of mischief on their minds. And she is tasked to make sure that... Um, books stay as the author intended and don't, you know, um, uh, don't sort of like variance to that. Um, that's pretty much what the series is about, um, but it, it tends to jump around all over the place. Uh, the Woman Who Died a Lot, the latest in the series, um, because uh, my, my heroine Thursday Next has a, um, has a family life as well in, in her version of, uh, of the United Kingdom, um, occasionally we come back and deal with domestic troubles um, at home, which are always of a slight absurd and eccentric nature. And, and that's what pretty much happens um, in The Woman Who Died a Lot. Great. Well, the, the Thursday Next novels are obviously metafiction. They're books about books and more specifically books about characters and plots of many well-known books. This, despite mm. the obvious love for story and literature that comes through in, in your novels, I understand from previous interviews that the first book in the series was rejected numerous times by publishers. I, I'm curious, do, why do you think there was such a resistance to the series, especially among an audience of editors who love books and reading? Um it, yeah, I mean, it's who knows. I mean, there's there's there's, there's two, uh, two two schools of thought here. I mean, f firstly, that I spent a, a great deal of time writing uh, the book. I think it probably took about seven years from uh, you know completing it for the first time uh, and then to actually getting it published. And there's a lot of rewriting in between. So it might be simply that um, it actually got good enough because I'd been rewriting and you know teaching myself the craft because I, I had no published book before this. Um, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it would be that here was a book um, being submitted to main, mainstream publishers that had um, that had uh, Jane Eyre in it, that also had time travel, um, werewolves, a vampire, um, 
a uh, alternative history, science fiction, uh, was clearly a fantasy novel, and also had um, an interesting digression on the authorship of the Shakespeare plays. Now, that is a heady broth for <laughs> someone to take in. And for the most part, all those rejections, uh, no one ever read it. They just read the pricey. And of course, if you read the pricey for a book like that, you go, well, this is complete nonsense, and it can't possibly work, especially if it's, you know, if it's the 90s. So um, I just managed to get an agent. Uh, eventually, who read the book, read the whole thing, and then could actually go to an editor and say, listen, I know this sounds bad, I can't paraphrase it, just read it, I promise you you'll like it. And that's how I got published. Great. Well, prior to writing the first book in the Thursday Next <laughs> series, had you written more conventional novels or thrillers? And what was the process that led up to you writing the first Thursday Next novel? Um, no, I mean, it was the third novel I'd, I'd written. Um, I wrote seven when I was trying to be published, seven over 11 years. Uh, the first two in the series were two books I now have published, which were, the first one was a, a police procedural with Humpty Dumpty as the victim called The Big Over Easy. Um, that's, that's, that's published. Uh, and the second one was um, another police procedural, but this time it was a, uh, a sort of retelling of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you know, Goldilocks being an enigmatic blonde who goes missing. Um, and they're kind of both mystery thrillers, but obviously explaining away um, you know, the backstory of the, um, the nursery rhymes, which at the time when I first wrote them, 93, 94, and were published in 2005, 2006, um, was actually quite sort of relatively original. Um, so now, I think a lot of people are doing similar things. Um, but uh, but the, the, the sort of central conceit of those two books, which was kind of um, looking at um, characters uh, within fiction and then sort of clothing them with uh, with new situations, uh, unusual situations, um, was kind of similar to the first next book. So I don't really do serious books. Uh, I just do sort of absurdist um, fantasy kind of weird stuff. Gotcha. What, what, what's the process like for you when you sit down to write a new novel? Do you do you do you plot it out before you start writing the first page? No, no, not at all. No, um, I, I I can't do that whole um, you know plan thing. Um, I I find uh, my, my most of most of or all of my um, ideas really come on the hoof. It's actually when I'm writing them writing down. I go right, okay, we're going to start off with two people, you know, and they're in a they're in a train, and where are they going and why? And then you go, well, they're clearly going for this, but why are they doing this? And you go, well, they must be doing that. And then, ah, oh, but if they're doing that, surely, you know, X is involved, the X is involved. How would Y feel about that? And before you know it, because this is a series book, everything just starts slotting into place. And then I just have ideas, and I think, well, that'd be fun. You know, why don't we do this? Why don't we have that? And, um, and I, just start, I just start writing, and then I rewrite in constantly, obviously, because I'll get to, um, you know, 50,000 words in. And then I have, an, I have a, a great idea, and I go, ah, brilliant, but I've got to rewrite the whole book. And I go, right, straight back, rewrite, and then kind of rewrite the whole book again. And so I just rewrite and rewrite and rewrite and add and rewrite and then delete and rewrite again. And, and after about 110 days, which is usually what it takes me, over the space of about seven months, um, a book emerges in a sort of, um, I suppose you'd, you know, if I was trying to be highfalutin, I'd say in an organic fashion, but I think it's probably more fungal to be honest. <laughs> well, well, do you have in mind bef before you start writing or, or as you're thinking ahead in terms of specifically the Thursday next novels, do you, do you have in mind partic particular genres or, or types of novels that you would want to include in the novel itself? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have vague ideas where it wants to go. You know, if, I, if I'm thinking, you know, uh, I, at the beginning of a book a while back, I think it was, uh, I think it was something rotten. I, I thought, oh, I haven't done Western. I haven't done Western for a while. So why don't I do Western? So the first chapter was um, was Thursday, uh, and a couple of the other members of Juris Fiction, this policing agency inside the book world, and they were chasing um, the Minotaur who's escaped um, across uh, the Western genre. Um, so they're just sort of marching to all these western towns. And they, they've actually darted him with slapstick. So they're actually chasing the Minotaur across the western genre, um, looking for outbreaks of custard pies in faces and, you know, saucepans in the face. So it's that kind of idea. You know, I think, well, you know, what can I do? What can I use? How can I use it? What's really unusual? What's, what's the sort of random aspect to it that I think would be quite fun? And how would it fit into the story as a whole? Um, so it's really just sort of you just sit there and kind of think up bizarre ideas 
that kind of work and, uh, and then just start running with them. Gotcha. And and what has been the, the reception? I mean, obviously the books are bestsellers now, but what has been the reception specifically among booksellers and librarians who tend to be, you know, obviously devoted book lovers themselves? Um, uh, very strong. Um, librarians in particular are hugely, um, uh, hu- hugely sort of supportive of my writing because um, a lot of it covers classical characters and classical books. Um, which which they they like to make you know, but librarians you know are in the job because they love books and they love stories, and I tend to sort of think of the Thursday next series as uh, how I how I describe it is um, stories uh, for people love, who love books, books for people who love stories. You know, a celebration of story, if you like, in the way that we tell them, in the way we write them, the way we punctuate them, the way we print them, even. Um, and it's just uh, it's just really a sort of nice broad, uh, sort of slightly comedic and wry look at the whole um, at the whole uh, publishing uh, the publishing world. And of course, like book librarians, as like booksellers, um, they love books. So um, it's a funny book about books. Great. So I think that's why they like it. Well, well, given your career to date, what advice would you have for listeners who are aspiring writers and want to write and publish their own novels? Oh, I see. Um, well, um, the, the first thing I say is uh, think long term. Um, in general, um, to get published, um, you know, in, in the in the sort of classical way. I mean, you could you could of course publish um, whatever you wanted tomorrow. You could you could slap together a hundred thousand words and you could publish it. Um, you publish it tomorrow. Um, whether it's going to be any good or not, of course, is another thing. So whether it's going to sell is obviously based on quality. Forget about marketing publicity. Quality is what sells. Always remember that. It's quality. It's not, you know, the Facebook. It's not the tweet. It's not the gimmick. It's not this. It's quality. That's what sells books. It's good stories, good characters, well told. So I would say, um, I would say think long term is a very important thing. Um, for the most part, I've found that um, most authors um, get published or are accepted to be published um, on their seventh book um, after about 10 or 11 years. That is pretty much normal. That is learning one's craft. Um, and really, uh, I think that's, I think that's about, about, it does seem to be about right. And that might be disheartening, um, but um, this is about writing quality. And, uh, and well, I thought my first book when I first wrote it was good enough to be published, but it was only when I came to rewrite it for publication 14 years later that I, I, I could see, easily see its shortcomings. So um, think long term, um, be a merciless self-critic, uh, is very important. You want to reread it, and if you, if you think, yeah, that's all right, it's not. If you think, ah, there's something wrong here, I don't know what it is, and then you stare at it and you move something around, you go, it's still not right. Listen to that voice that says it's not right, it's not working. You know, read it aloud. I mean, there's a lot to be said for reading stuff aloud. Um, but it's, it's a hard one, and you've got to learn to be your best, your own, the best editor you, you have because um, there's no one else who's going to you know, say whether it's uh, good or bad or indifferent except, um, except yourself. Um, it's difficult now with e-publishing because <laughs> I think what happens is, um, is a lot of people are so eager to be published that they just publish their first novel. And and then they get disheartened when they when you know they have nine downloads <laughs> all from the family and give up. Um, and of course, you know that's I think that's that's very disheartening because they shouldn't give up. You shouldn't give up uh, because you just maybe you're not ready yet. You know maybe it was really just a first draft. You know to be brutally honest. And I think really if you want to um, if you want to you know really get into the to be a professional writer. Of course, if you just want to publish a book, that's that's quite different. But if you want to be a professional writer who will carry on selling books and increase in sales in books, it, it's it's got to be good, and you've got to you've got to really think very carefully about um uh, about you know the sort of stuff that you're that you're writing, and it's 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 hard. But that's why agents and publishers were actually quite good because <laughs> they knew well, they could say yes, it's you or no, it's not. Yeah. Well, well, it's tricky. Well, given given the the uh, subject matter of the Thursday next novels, uh, as you said, the the kind of meditation on story and and, and novels mm. and reading. What what do you think about e publishing? I mean, obviously, as you oh, I, it, go ahead. 
Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, e-publishing, you know, a book is a book. It doesn't matter what, if, you know, if you were to, uh, if you were to paint it on a wall or, you know, or write it on a lizard, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's all stories. It, it doesn't, it, the medium does not matter. Um, so, you know, e- e-publishing, it's still just books. You know, we're not, I mean, per, speaking personally, I love paper. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that's just me because I'm kind of getting on a bit. But, um, for the, um, for people, you know, um, people, you know, perhaps in their, you know, late teens or early twenties now who are growing up with reading stuff on devices, of course, some um, devices look, uh, there's nothing wrong with devices at all. So, yeah, um, uh, e-publishing, there's nothing wrong with it, I think, but, um, it, it's going to be tricky as it finds its, um, finds its feet. Sure. Because, uh, um, the, there has to be a way in which, you know, you, you know, people will will say, okay, this is what you should read, this is what you shouldn't, this is what's recommended, and this is this is what isn't, um, and it's difficult to be heard. You know, the, the more the, the more fi- the more ways in which we find to 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 speak, you know, the the harder it is to be heard. Um, so it's difficult. But it goes back to what I said previously: it's quality, 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 quality. That is what will always rise to the top when it comes to writing. And um, yeah, just um, you know, try and, try and try and sort of you know shrug off that um, uh, you know the spectre of self-delusion and say you know say to yourself really seriously, okay, is this working as a book? And you sort of stare at it for a while and read your first chapter, read your first paragraph, read your first sentence, thinking is it working? Um, and that's really, I mean, all you can do really write good books. Sure. So quality. So so speaking of that, what are you writing now? Have you started working on another novel? Um, yeah, I'm, at the moment I'm working. I have a series, a young adult series, going called uh, The Last Dragon Slayer, um, just being published here in the US. And uh, <clears throat> I've written number two. That's out in the UK, and uh, I've got to write number three. So that's the one I'm looking at at the moment, um, and that will hopefully be finished by the end of the year. And then I've got a, um, I think I've got actually I've got, hmm, I'm doing a bit cramped really, but I'm meant to be doing about one and a half books next year, so it's going to be quite a big year. <laughs> so where can where yeah, can people easy. find you online? Sorry, where can people find you online? Oh, uh, jasperford.com. dot com. Um, yeah, uh, Jasper, you know, J A S P R, and then Ford is double F O R D E. So all one word, jasperford.com. Um, my very, very old-fashioned website, which is a completely 100% uh, author-generated website. There's not a single um, scrap of text anywhere in it that has not been uh, um, put together by my stuff or, or my wife. Um, and there's tons of stuff there that you can uh, look at. There are special features. There are all kinds of how, how I wrote the book. Because um, I always think, you know, DVDs, you get the special features. <laughs> I thought, I can do that. So about uh, seven or eight years ago, I started doing special features for my books. And you can just have a look at deleted scenes. Um, and you can see why they were deleted, because they weren't very good, or they were boring, or they didn't uh, progress the story. So, yeah, there's a lot on there. And for anyone who is perhaps, you know, wanting to write or, you know, having, having a think about it, again, there's some, um, there's some stuff there about writing as well. Great. And I'll have a link to that in the show notes so that people can look at as well. Okay. That'd be brilliant. Well, again, we've been speaking with Jasper Ford, the author of the Thursday Next Novels and also The Last Dragon Slayer, as he just mentioned. His latest book, The Woman Who Died a Lot, the latest Thursday Next novel is available in bookstores now. You should check it out. Jasper, thanks for doing the interview. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Parent, volunteer, employee. With your different roles and busy schedule, how can you find time to complete the degree you once started? Cornerstone University's programs are designed for busy adults like you. Take one course at a time, back-to-back to to move through your degree quickly. Attend through an on-campus, live stream, or 100% online format, whichever works best for you. If you're ready to go further in your goals, we're here to make it possible. Achieve without ceasing. Learn more at adult.cornerstone.edu. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now enjoy a large iced coffee for just 2 bucks and a breakfast sandwich to make a meal. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal.